Well, we're wrapping up 2011, and I think it bears looking at some of the ways things are changing in this world, particularly in the world of social media. Twitter and Facebook, of course, played a major role in the organization and mobilization of the Arab Spring, as well as Occupy Wall Street. And it turns out the CIA actually has an entire department, people whose job it is, to sift through tweets. And according to the Associated Press, they go through about 5 million tweets a day. And I think it's worth noting, because of some things that are happening as a result of this, and because really, this isn't discussed enough. Now, on one hand, Twitter is public for the world to see, Facebook a little less so, but people are posting their business online. So just a little earlier, I spoke to investigative journalist Wayne Madsen. I asked him, shouldn't people expect that others, including the government, will read what they post? Well, absolutely. We have to look at where the seed money came for these social networks. We do know that the Central Intelligence Agency, through NQTEL, its venture capital firm, provided uh, a lot of seed money for many of these companies that develop these social networking uh, operations and programs. So uh, people have to be aware that, the, that when they put personal information online, they're basically doing the CIA's job for them. They're giving, they're, it's, why don't they just pack up all their personal information and send it to Langley, Virginia? <laughs> but let's talk about something that happened recently, because we are still very new in terms of uh, the results and the consequences of social media, Twitter, Facebook, etc. But something that happened very recently, the district attorney's office in Boston a couple weeks ago subpoenaed Twitter. They asked for user information and IP addresses for people involved with Occupy Boston. We're showing right now on the screen a copy of the subpoena that's apparently been leaked. And you can see here the assistant district attorney, Benjamin Goldberger, saying this information is needed for a criminal investigation asking for the IP addresses of these specific names. Uh, he doesn't seem to understand that hashtags are actually not Twitter handles, but uh, that's fine. Uh, Wayne, uh, are we going to see more of this, more legal action like this in the future? I think so, because what the intelligence agencies and law enforcement want to ascertain is uh, if they have one person under investigation, uh, they want to see who their, all their, their friends and family uh, members are. So they're going to build, start building up these lists, and then they're going to run them through these uh, relational database, very sophisticated algorithms uh, to find out, uh, you know, wh wh who's friends uh, with a, a person under surveillance, what kind of politics they practice, uh, uh, religious information, uh, you know, and this type of thing. You know, the, the CIA and FBI got in trouble for this kind of thing after Watergate, and, it, and the, the, the laws were so restrictive on the FBI, they couldn't even keep clippings on people from the newspaper. Uh, there's a reason for it then, and there should be a reason for it now. It's called fishing expeditions, and the federal government can't go on fishing expeditions unless they have a criminal predicate and probable cause. I don't think they have probable cause in Boston to look at people involved with Occupy Wall Street. That's, that, that's just called a fishing expedition. But don't you think, Wayne, it's a little bit different? I mean, back in the, in, you know, the time of Watergate uh, in the 60s and 70s, um, Newspapers were there. Uh, people are, were not posting their own personal information. These days, that's exactly what happens. I mean, you say that people are doing the CIA's job for them, but don't you think right. it's a little different when people choose to put their thoughts out there and they choose to, to be on Twitter, they choose to be on Facebook? Uh, they go in knowing that other people out there, including the government, are going to see this. Well, they, they, there's obviously a problem now. People have no sense of privacy. Uh, they're willing to take their personal information, what they do almost on a minute-to-minute -minute basis in some cases, and put this online. Not that the CIA is interested in all that, uh, you know, what movies are saying, what, you know, songs they like to hear. But um, uh, I think there's a sense that people have no sense of keep, ensuring their own privacy. The, the one way to avoid the surveillance state is to just say no to these social networking uh, programs. But Wayne, it's, it's 2011. This is how a lot of people, including myself as a journalist, um, this is how I find out a lot of information, how I find out the top news stories that I'm interested in through Twitter. This is how I keep in touch with my friends. I mean, what do you say to people, Wayne, who say, you know, that's just kind of an old-fashioned way of thinking. Social network is here to stay. The question is how to best deal with it. Well, I, you're right, and, and obviously we use email, which can also be looked at by these same agencies. The, the problem is 
would you engage in a private conversation yelling at the top of your voice on a city street? You wouldn't do that. Uh, so you shouldn't, there's certain information you probably shouldn't be putting online for everyone to see. Now, obviously there's some social networks like LinkedIn that are used professionally by a lot of companies, a lot of businessmen. Now that kind of information could be of uh, interest to the CIA because they're doing this under open, open source collection and that gets into the area of business competitive intelligence and that's the type of information the CIA really wants but that could cost the company a lot of money if that information should wind up in the hands of the government who would share it with potentially other countries other agencies and in, in, in countries where they may be competitors to their own um, um, uh, business interests I think it's an important point, and, and I think there is a really fine line here. People do complain about the infringement on their civil liberties, but they're happy, as I am, I'll be honest, when, you know, you get a friendly iPhone uh, recommendation about, you know, great Vietnamese food in a three-block radius of where you're standing. Um, so I think that there's positives, too, but, but here's one of the most common arguments that I hear, Wayne, and that is, well, I'm not doing anything that I have to be ashamed of. I, I don't have anything to hide, so I don't care that that stuff's all out there. So I want to ask you, um, why should people care? Well, let's just say that uh, somebody decides I want to go down to the Occupy Wall Street demonstration. They'll say, well, I have nothing to hide. But then they wind up on a list as somebody who supports the movement. And then they wind up in various national security and intelligence databases. So the next time they go to the airport to try to get a flight, they're pulled aside as a potential security risk merely because of something they've done. The government thinks that they're some sort of a threat, but they don't think what they're doing is a threat. But they're not the ones to make those decisions. The government makes those decisions. Certainly an interesting discussion and one that needs to be had more, I would argue. Investigative journalist Wayne Madsen in Tampa, Florida.